We are very pleased here this evening to have with us uh, Peyton Jenkins. Peyton is uh, the only non-full-time preacher in a family of preachers, and he comes from us uh, <clears throat> from Buckner, Missouri. There he is, a manager at the Mid-Continent Public Library. He worships at the Higginsville Congregation, where he is very involved with the work of the Lord. Uh, we are regular supporters of his parents, Eugene and Lavinia Jenkins. I uh, also had found out through uh, some very much diligent research on my own that he's a pretty good neighbor, too. So <laughs> you might ask him or his neighbors that happen to be here tonight about that later. We really do look forward to his uh, lesson that he brings us here this evening as we look at fake news about our ability to live God's way. Yes, I try to be a good neighbor. Uh, I try to stay out of the way, except for when I show up unannounced for dinner. So uh, for those of you who don't get the joke, I live next door to my mom and dad. So that's the... Great to be here. I, I really appreciate this congregation. I appreciate every opportunity I have to, to speak, um, especially here. Um, it's great to see a lot of faces that I know and love um, and to, to get the opportunity to, to talk about God's Word with you. Um, I did realize, um, you know, pretty much pulling into the parking lot that I forgot to remind anyone at Higginsville that I was going to be here tonight. So, uh, Brother Mike, if I could get a note for my elders, that would be very helpful to me. Um, so tonight we're talking about fake news about our ability to live God's way. And I um, have a feeling that uh, this is going to maybe recap some things that you've been talking about all week. I Unfortunately, I was not able to make it to any of the other lessons this week. I saw your speakers, and I saw your, your titles, and I know that was a, a good series, and I am honored to be among those speakers. But I think that I have a feeling, knowing those guys, that I'm going to say something that they either have all directly said or at least alluded to, and that is, I'm not going to tell you anything you don't already know. I'm not going to tell you anything that you haven't already read. I'm not going to tell you anything you haven't already lived. The examples, the, the, the verses we're going to look at are things that you have learned since you were children, most of you, many of you. These are things that we have talked about since vacation Bible school. These are things that we've talked about since Bible camp. These are things that we've been t learning our whole Christian lives. And uh, many of us, fortunate enough to be raised in Christian homes even before we became Christians. This is not new stuff, but sometimes it, it can be so overpowering, the things that we face in the world, that these basic things... They're, they're worth revisiting, and we need to be told again. So there's nothing new here, uh, but hopefully it is something that will be helpful. I think that we can all agree that it is a hard time to be a Christian. It, it's When we look at the world around us, when we look at the nation that we live in, when we see the, the friends and coworkers and, and neighbors, you know, present company excluded, uh, that... Uh, that we surround ourselves with, it, it can be hard to be a Christian. There's pulls, there's influences, there's challenges every, everywhere we turn. We live in a, a politically divided time. Um, I have seen that this division grow even in my own lifetime. Uh, I, I, we, we live in a, in a world where you're either all this or you're all that, and that there's not any, any room to, to figure out what the truth is, which often might lie in the middle or even elsewhere. We live in a time that's full of a multitude of religions and religious organizations and, and religious thought that are all crowding each other out, that are all arguing and, and shouting over one another and all trying to, to speak up the loudest and tripping over themselves to get the most people that all contradict each other in some parts, but then all at the same time want to pretend that they're all okay. That's very confusing. We live in a very sexualized culture where everything and everyone is seen as an object, where uh, we breed this sort of insanity that sort of exploded in our pop culture in the last year, uh, and then we all wonder, we being the culture, wonder where this came from. Well, it's because it's what we've been spoon-feeding ourselves for, for so many years through entertainment and, and through media. People have um, asked me, people know that I'm, a, I'm a, a, a film buff, a movie buff, they, they've asked me, well, did you watch the Oscars this year? And I, my answer is no, because I don't want to watch something, be, I don't want to be lectured by a bunch of rich people for the same things that they've all been shown as guilty of being doing this whole last year. Um, it, we, we live in a culture that's just saturated with that. We live in a culture in a time 
where people are seeking a distraction or diversion or entertainment over truth, where they're, they're more focused on uh, what new uh, gadget or, or what new uh, technology or, or what new entertainment um, can distract them from the difficult subjects of their lives. Uh, we're living in a time where families are in shambles and where the definitions of families are, are being challenged and, and being redefined. We're in a culture, in a, in a world where money and things matter more than anything else and, and how you get to where you're going um, or, or getting to the top makes, makes more difference than, than how you get there. We live in a world where power is an end to itself, where people want authority, where people want to be able to make the world as they want to, that they want to shape things to fit their own image. And it seems like the good old days are feeling farther and farther away. It seems like the, the, the farther we go, the, the deeper into this world we go, um, the times when things were simpler, the times when things were easier seem more distant in the rearview mirror. But I would argue um, that this has always been the case. And while these things are all uh, very obviously parts of our modern day culture, I say if we look back in, in time, if we look back in history, we can see that these things have always been there. I think everything that I just said, maybe not the Oscars, uh, we could also apply to, to ancient Rome, right? The, the, the first century church lived in times very much like those same things, where, where it was all about power, where it was all about money, all about sex, all about all the things that make it hard for us to be Christians. It's always been the case because this is human nature. God didn't create us this way. God created us to be, to be whole, to be holy, to, to be pure to him. Um, we have been corrupted by sin as, as humans and in, as individuals. Uh, so when I say it's human nature, I don't mean that God planted it in us, but I mean that it's the way that it goes now. It, it's, it's the nature of the world. It's the, the nature of our lives that we start pure and we get corrupted. So all of these things are not about 2018 in America. These are about any time and any place where you're a human being and when you're trying to do God's will. It's a hard time to be a Christian, but it has always been a hard time to be a Christian. There's never been a time when it's been easy. And that's kind of the point. So I know that's maybe a negative way to start the lesson, but I, I actually want to, to take that and look at it from a place of positivity and a place of hope and a place of encouragement and recognize that the way things are now are the way they've always been, and it's the way that it always is going to be. And sure, maybe we could chart some ups and downs, some peaks and valleys in maybe our own recent history or the recent history of this nation, but as a whole, we tend towards corruption. We tend towards sin as the human race. If we go way back to the very beginning, let's look in Genesis chapter 6. And this is the part where I told you that I'm not showing you anything you've never seen before. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's a strong judgment. That, that's a, a powerful condemnation. That God could look out and see that the entire world, the sum of the imagination of man, was wickedness. That the, the entirety of our ingenuity, of our creativity, was directed towards evil. <coughs> It's always been hard, but we know that uh, Genesis chapter 6 follows us up, verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That it was a corrupt and terrible place. All the things that I just mentioned are still true or were true then, potentially even worse, seeing how he destroyed the world uh, to get rid of it. But we see here in verse 8, Noah found grace in the eyes of God. He did it. He lived it. The, the fake news that we don't have the ability to live God's way has always been false. It's false now. It was false for Noah. Talk about pressure, right? He, he, was, he and his family were the ones on the earth to make a difference, to, to follow God, and yet they did. And this, of course, is under the, the Old Testament, or even before the Old Testament actually was in effect. Christianity itself, though, was born in a dark age. When we, I've already mentioned the, the Roman Empire, the first century church faced great persecution. The second century church <laughs> faced great persecution. It's part of who we are as God's people. Whatever dispensation, whether it's the, the um, patriarchal, as we see in, in Noah's day, whether it was the mosaical or whether it's the Christian age, whatever dispensation, God's people have been called to be different from the rest of the world. And that's something that I think we overlook. I think sometimes we get so worried about how hard it is to be a Christian in 2018 
that we forget that is actually the point. That was the way it was designed from the beginning. That's the way it was designed from Genesis chapter 3, uh, verse on, uh, chapter 3 on, uh, chapter 3, verse 1 and on, um, is that we are designed to stand out, to be different, to face the difficulties. We have always been different if we're, we're ever calling ourselves God's people. Also, God's people have always suffered for it. We've always stood out, and we've always been punished by the world for being different. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 1 for a, a, just a quick, quick glance here. Exodus chapter 1, as it sets up the Israelite captivity in Egypt and the life that they lived in, in slavery, we can start in verse 8, where it says, Now there arose a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it came to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also into our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Python and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage and mortar and in brick and in manner of service in the field. And all their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. That's describing slavery. These people were, they stood out. The Israelites were different from the world, and they suffered because of it. They were put in a terrible situation. And this is something that actually just occurred to me um, even this week as I was thinking through this lesson, that they stayed in slavery for something like, I didn't do the math, something like 300 years. Some, some preacher out there can, can help me figure out if I'm right or wrong there. Something like 300, 400 years that the Israelites were in slavery. God left them in slavery that long. He let them suffer. God let his people suffer. He has always done that. He's put us in this world where we have the perfect conditions to be made, uh, to, to stand out as, as children of God. And he leaves us here, and he lets us suffer. That doesn't mean that he's cruel. It doesn't mean that he doesn't love us. It means that he knows that we can take it. He knows that being a Christian, that, that being a, a faithful child of God, again, I know we're in this particular example we're not talking about Christians, uh, but being a child of God means that you are different, and it means that you are strong, and it means that you can take the suffering. It's not that God has always sailed in and saved us from ourselves. He did that once. We'll talk about that as we go. Um, but that uh, we are given the opportunity to grow wherever we're planted. In this case, it's slavery. Uh, as we're going to see throughout the rest of this lesson, it's in a lot of other areas as well. So we've always been different. We've always been expected to be different. We've always suffered because of our difference. But this is the point. We have always prevailed. We've always made it. Again, it's not always been easy, and like I said, the Israelites were there for you know, 300, 400 years, give or take. But they came out. There was a point when God sent Moses to lead them out. There was a point when they made it through. There's a lot of generations that died in slavery, but they died faithfully. That shows us that it is possible. It is possible to be faithful in hard things. Let's look at Second Peter chapter 2 verses 4 through 9. We're jumping a little bit back in time to talk about Lot here. That's 2 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 4. We're going to get a little more than Lot because we're going to see some bigger context here. <laughs> For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them unto chains of darkness, to be reserved unto judgment... And spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that afterward should live godly. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them, and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds." God, excuse me, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust into the day of judgment to be punished. 
He uses three examples here to, to, to lead to one major point in verse 9. In, in verse 4, he's saying that he didn't spare even the angels that rebelled against him. In verse 5, he says that he did save Noah out of the world, as we've already discussed. Verses 6, 7, and 8, he's talking about Lot. We'll come back to that. All of this is to point out in verse 9, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. Those people suffered. Noah suffered as he was living on that earth, building that ark, facing ridicule, preaching to people who were not listening, people who were scoffing. As it points out here, Lot suffered living in those ungodly cities, living there, seeing, as it says, of the, the unlawful deeds uh, of the people. Let's just read that verse 8 again. For, among that righteous man, for that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vex his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. He was there. He saw it. He was surrounded by it. His neighbors, his friends, his co-workers, they were all that way. They, they were all wicked, and he was there, but he stayed strong. And this is to illustrate the point in verse 9, that God knows how to preserve his people. So yes, we've always stood out, and that's been on purpose. Yes, we have faced difficulty, and we have suffered, and that's okay. But the point is that we have always prevailed. And I can promise you this, that Lot prevailed because he chose to prevail. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't that God snatched him out of it. It wasn't that God protected him. It's that he chose to. The Bible would not call Lot a righteous man if he wasn't a righteous man. When we look at the Genesis account of Lot, we can find things to quibble with. We can find things that we really would like to be different. But here we see that he withstood. He made it through. And it was hard. And in some ways, we could even say that he had a harder time than Noah because at least Noah had his whole family with him, whereas Lot lost everything. Some of them made it out of the city, but he then eventually still lost them too. The point that I'm trying to make here is that even though it's hard, even though we sometimes don't know how we're going to make it, we can make it. One of our elders at Higginsville, um, Ed Johnson, many of you know him, had this, this wonderful line that I don't realize that he... I don't think he realized quite the powerful quote that he was giving me when he, he said this in a Bible class on Sunday. How many times does God have to win before we accept the fact that he never loses? How many times do we have to, to watch his people succeed through these horrible things before we accept the fact that he doesn't lose, that he doesn't let go of anyone? We can take ourselves out of his hand, but, but he is there with us and for us if we want to be with him. So all of that is by way of introduction. Uh, I really tried to approach this lesson in, in thinking, how can we take these things that we know are true, the, the, the fact that we live in a really sick and weird and strange world and time and place, and then how can we recognize that that's always been the case, and then how can we take something positive out of it? And so the following is what I came up with. I want to look at some reactions of God's people throughout the years. We've seen the examples already of, of uh, the Israelites, of, of Lot, and of Noah. But if we start looking at the Bible, we can recognize that it's a catalog of people who faced horrible things and made it. People who faced terrible difficulties, dire straits, but chose to overcome. And I hope that we can, from these examples, from the reactions of these godly men and women, that we can understand that the same principles apply today different dispensation in some cases, different methods in some places, different temptations in all places. But the point is that we see that everyday, ordinary men and women like you and I have made it. It always amazes me when I, I look at the Bible and think of it as a catalog of God's people. And it's the history of kings and slaves and soldiers and housewives and merchants and doctors and tax collectors and politicians and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, who chose to follow God. There's no barrier here of class. There's no barrier here of race or of, of, of gender. It's people who chose to follow God no matter what their circumstances, good or bad. So let's dive in. We're going to start with um, Esther. Let's look at the book of Esther, chapter 3. And like I said before, nothing here that you don't already know. As a matter of fact, you could probably take the same list of people I'm about to walk you through and make a really great VBS out of it. So that one's for free. You can have that. That's Esther chapter 3. 
which um, in my Bible is hiding right behind Nehemiah. There we go. Chapter 3, verses 8 through 11, setting us up here. And Haman said unto king Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom. And their laws are diverse from all people, neither keep they the king's laws. Therefore it is not for the king's prophet to suffer them. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed. And I will pay ten thousand talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business to bring it unto the king's treasures, treasuries. And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, the Jew's enemy. And the king said unto Haman, The silver is given to thee, the people also, to do with them as it seemeth good to thee. So there's our setup. We have Haman here, the king's advisor, who's saying there's people in your kingdom who don't follow you, that they do their own thing. We've got to get rid of them. If we sort of ignore the context and look at verse 8 again, let's see if this sounds familiar to us today in 2018. There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom, and their laws are diverse from all people. Neither keep they the king's laws. Therefore, it is not for the king's prophet to suffer them. Sound familiar? Could we apply those same words to the way that we are looked at today? Could the early Christians in the first century in Rome apply those same words to the way that they lived that time? Absolutely. We see that God's people are targeted because they're different. They're, they're targeted because they have a different set of belief and, and custom and law that contradicts everything that this ungodly regime stands for. There's, there's our setting. If we skip ahead to chapter 4, we're only going to look at two verses here. The two verses that everyone remembers out of Esther, verses 13 and 14. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape from the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether hold thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise from the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed, and who knows whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. That's a powerful phrase. That's a, that's a powerful thought. Who knows if you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Mordecai is saying, you, Esther, are in this position so that you can be of service to God. This is not about you, Esther. This is not about you being the queen or the consort of the king. This is not about you winning a competition. This is about you being in a position where you can serve God. It is a hard place to be. We can see that if the, the Jews, the Israelites, are the ones they're targeting anyway, she's hiding herself. She's, they don't know who she is or what her background is. He's pushing her into this difficult situation where he says, you have to reveal yourself and you have to make this right. You have to use what influence you've got. And of course, she answers at the end of verse 16, if I perish, I perish. She makes the right decision. This is not a superhero this is an average woman in an extreme circumstance. This is probably a young woman. This might be a teenager in a difficult and extreme circumstance who decides my service to God, my service to God's people is more important than my comfort and it's more important than even my safety. This is a person who is faced with the fake news that she couldn't serve God in this position. She couldn't serve God and be in the, the court of the king. But she's facing that fake news, and she's answering it with truth. She says, if I perish, I perish. This is what I have to do. This is the only option I have if I'm going to serve God. The same occurrence happens over and over again. We can see it again in Daniel, chapter 3. We'll look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, where they're faced with almost an exact same situation. That's Daniel chapter 3. We'll read verses 14 through 20. This, of course, is after the, the king has set up his idol, uh, most likely of himself, and commanded that everyone fall down and worship it. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have refused... Starting in verse 14, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do, you not, do ye not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. 
But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast at the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this manner. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. That's powerful. And these are not superheroes. These are three young men. These are three probably teenagers who are in an extreme circumstance. These people have already, these three men, have already been kidnapped out of their homes, taken captivity by a foreign nation, made slaves, made eunuchs in the king's court. They have suffered indignity. They have suffered pain. They have lost things. They have lost people. They are in an impossible situation. They're in an environment where the king literally says, here is a statue of myself. When you hear the music, bow down or I'm going to burn you alive. We don't face that today. <laughs> you know, we worry about being unfriended on Facebook. We worry about maybe having to find someone else to sit with at lunch. We worry about maybe losing our job. Sure, that's a big one, but we can still find something else. They were threatened and then followed up on being thrown into fire. These are ordinary people facing extreme circumstances, and their answer is so powerful. When they say in verse 16, we are not careful to answer thee in this manner. They, they say we, we are not even going to try to be nice. We're, we're not going to try to word ourselves carefully. We're just going to say, verse 17, uh, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. If you push us in there, then we believe that we have a God who can save us. Verse 18, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods. They say we will serve a God who can save us, but even if he doesn't, we're still not going to do it. Even if he doesn't save us, we're still not going to do it. We're, we're still going to serve him. We're not going to serve you. Even if you put us in the fire and he lets us burn, we will accept it. Of course, in this instance, we know that, that he did miraculously save them, but that's not the point. They didn't know that at the time. They did not know that at the time. That was not prearranged with God. They did not have a deal with him that, you know, hey, God, if we ever thrown in the fiery furnace and you're going to save us, that's not the point. The point is that they were three ordinary people in extreme circumstances who chose to do the right thing, who chose to live God's will. Once again, the exact same thing happens just a couple of chapters later in Daniel chapter 6. It's amazing how the world doesn't learn, right? It's amazing how the, they try the same tricks over and over again. And it's amazing how the people of God over time have always, not always, not 100% of the time, but there always are examples of people who have stood up and, and done the right thing, been counted among the righteous. Daniel chapter 6, verses 7 through 10. This is later on. This is a different king. You get the impression that Daniel is a much older man at this point. But it tells us in Daniel chapter 6, verse 7, that all the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for thirty days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. That is courage. That's not a superhero. It's an old man having courage to hear this, to see that it's happening, and his response is to do the very thing that they're threatening his life for. When they say the law now is you cannot worship, you cannot pray to anyone but the king, and his response is to go into his house, to open his window and continue. I love the way that this says it, as aforetime. Nothing changed. Nothing altered in his manner. Nothing altered in his, in his, uh, his way of doing things, in his schedule, in his system. He did what he always did before, which was worship God, pray to God. It's an extreme circumstance. It's hard. It's the type of situation where any of us could look at it and say, okay, well, you know, we get that that's the law, so maybe you just pray, you know, in your house with the door closed on your own and you play along in the meantime. That's not what he did. 
he knew that serving God was worth the fate. It, it was worth the, the threat of punishment. It was worth being thrown into the lion's den. Same thing with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He did not know that he was going to be miraculously saved. That wasn't something he worked out ahead of time. It was something that God did, but he acted on this out of faith in God, knowing that spiritually he was okay, no matter what happened. We move forward. We can see in Acts chapter 7, now moving into the Christian age. Acts chapter 7, verses 54 through 60, we can see that Stephen, an example of someone who was not miraculously saved, someone who God did not step in to rescue from hate. Acts chapter 7, verse 54, we are missing the, the speech, the sermon that, uh, that Stephen gives to the Sanhedrin in the, the rest of this chapter, but we can see the effects of it. He has an opportunity to speak the truth to people who need it, perhaps more than anyone, definitely as much as anyone, people who need the truth. Their response in verse 54 is they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Again, this is an ordinary person. This is uh, someone who has become a Christian who is spreading the news that he knows he has to spread and he is stoned to death for it. He becomes the first Christian martyr. He loses his life for the sake of Christ and his response in verse 60 is, is wishing well on the people that are doing this to him. This is an extreme circumstance. This is not 2018 America, but this is something that he faced and that he faced the right way with courage, with conviction, without changing his mind, without changing his words. He went to his death accepting it because he knew that it was because he had done the right thing. Again, the focus here that I want to make on all these points is the reaction. That uh, he, he knew going into it that it was a difficult situation. And when it turned bad, when it turned ugly, when it got violent, his reaction is to stay the course, just like with all the others that we've seen so far. If we can move ahead, we'll look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And in verse 58 of the chapter we just read, it mentions a young man named Saul. Well, now we're going to see what that young man named Saul turned into. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 through 27, we know he becomes Paul. He becomes uh, the greatest uh, gospel preacher uh, that, of all time, that he writes more than half of the New Testament that he becomes a great defender for the gospel and for the truth. And we know that he pays the price for it as well. When we met Saul back in, in Acts chapter 7, he was at the top of the world, right? He was uh, presumably wealthy, given what we know about his background. He was educated. He was respected. He had political influence. By the time we get to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he has spent every last penny of that social capital on the gospel. He has given it up. He's left it behind. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 24, he says, Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Beside those things, I'm going past 27, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is offended, and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. He paid the price. He gave it up. He gave it up. He had everything that we talked about at the beginning of this lesson, right? He had the power. He had the influence. He had the things that this world grasped for, and he left it behind, and then he faced this stuff. When he's been beaten in verse 24 of the Jews, five times he received 40 stripes, save one. Five separate occasions was he beaten. He could have said, hey, I was one of you. I, I worked with you. I, I was on your side. He took it, though. Um, it tells us that um, in uh, verse um, verse 26, in perils among false brethren, 
that he was put in danger by being around people who claimed to be Christians but who turned out not to be Christ-like, that he associated himself and, and put himself in the hands of people who betrayed him. He talks about being shipwrecked. He talks about being hungry. He talks about being lost. This is from someone who had it all. He gave it up. And I, once again, I will say, this is not 2018 America. This is an extreme circumstance. And this is a man who chose the right path, who chose to hold on, who chose to suffer through. Let's now look at Hebrews chapter 11 to sort of top off this portion of the lesson. Hebrews chapter 11, which of course is the hall of fame of faith. My favorite part of this chapter is the very end when basically the Hebrews writer says, you know what, there's so many other hundreds of nameless people that we could talk about that we can't even get to them all. I'm just going to tell you what they did. And I think that's a nice summation of what we're talking about here tonight as well. Hebrews chapter 11, starting in verse 32. And what shall I, I say more? For the time would fail to tell me of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel markings, mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. That's powerful. That's men and women who made the choice to do those things. Uh, you get goosebumps when you read verse 37. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. Sawn asunder. That means they were sawn in half. That means they were laid out on a board and someone took a saw and sawed them in half. That's crazy. That's not 2018 America. We think we've got it bad, but we have not been sawn in half for the gospel. Sorry, get a little passionate there. Um, I, I love in here when he says, that uh, verse 38, of whom the world was not worthy, that this world was wicked and was cruel and it treated them terribly and it murdered them and it mistreated their families and it mocked them and it scourged them. The world was not worthy of them. The world was not worthy of the, the people that held fa uh, fast to the truth, that held fast to the faith. And that's why I get passionate because when we in 2018 say, you know, if I let my voice be heard, I'm going to lose whatever, this friend, this social capital, this opportunity, this, this or that. We're forgetting what people gave up for the gospel. And he makes the point, because we're talking about the, the previous dispensation, uh, the, the, the old law, he makes the point in verse 39 that these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise they were doing that for the hope of Jesus Christ coming. They were doing that because they expected that God would be faithful and would send someone to save them from their sins. We've got the real thing. We've got the actual article, the, 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 the thing that they were willing to suffer for because they hoped it would be there. We have access to it today, and we're afraid to lose friends on Facebook. And I'm preaching to myself as much as anyone. <laughs> I, I should have led with that too. Um, but the fact is, the Bible is a catalog of people in extreme circumstances who chose to do the right thing and paid for it. I refuse to believe that we have it worse than they did. I refuse to believe that if they can do it, we can't. If they can do it, we obviously can. If they can give that up, if they can go through what they gave up, then we can too. Don't believe them when they say that you can't be a Christian today. Don't believe them when they say that the things that we believe are outdated or outmoded or part of a bygone era. If these people can do what they did for the hope of Christ, we can do the same having the genuine real thing. I'd like to close with Matthew chapter 11 verses 28 and 30, or through 30. 
I said that I wanted this lesson to be positive and hopeful, but I know it's very serious. And I was struck as I was putting this lesson together of all these powerful and emotional subjects and, and people and examples. I, w I was struck by the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ, who makes this possible and, and gives us the reason to do it, that he said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This doesn't sound like an easy yoke. It doesn't sound like a light burden. It sounds hard, and it is hard. We've already established that. So what is he saying here? What, what's the point? He's, he, he says in another place, in, in Matthew chapter 10, that, you know, um, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. You're going to be at variance with your family, uh, that, that you're, you're going to draw, draw lines. You're going to be separated from the people that, that you love. But here he says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Well, that's the point, that we're reaching for that rest. The only place we have rest is through him. The world is going to be difficult whether you're a Christian or not. The world is going to be hard whether you're a Christian or not. It might be harder in some aspects for Christians, but it's still a pretty rotten place to live whether you are faithful or not. He's saying that put up with it all, deal with it, go through it, bring others through it, encourage and lift up others through it, and then you'll find the rest on the other side of it all. That this is the way to that rest is through the hardness, is through the difficulty, is, is through the extreme circumstances. On the other side of that, we find that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And then when we look back, we can realize that he was actually absolutely right. You know that when Noah and his family landed on that ark and they got out, the animals came out, there's the rainbow, the world is new again, that they knew that everything they had been through was worth it. That the years of preaching and building that ark and being ridiculed were worth it. That the time spent on that boat with a bunch of stinking animals and your whole family was worth it. Through the hard stuff, we get to that place where it's, it's good and it's light. The point is, we can live God's way. The question is, will we live God's way? It's not, can you do it? It's, are you going to do it? Of course, any of this is only as good as those is only as good as our willingness to follow the gospel in the first place. Of course, following the gospel starts by becoming a Christian. Becoming a Christian starts by hearing the word, by believing it, by repenting of your sins, by um, hear, believe, repent, confess the name of Christ, and being baptized for the forgiveness of those sins. If you need help with any of these things, then please come forward at this time.